G'day everyone. Can someone just give me an indication if you can hear me? Yep, brilliant. Okay, so we'll just give it another couple of minutes for a few people to join. And Jackson, he's working the clinic today. So like a typical clinic day, he might be a couple of minutes late. Um, now, there's quite a few questions that have come in. And because we ended up, I think we we're expecting about 50 people to register. And then we had about 400. So that kind of blew out the um, yeah, kind of Zoom allocation that we had. So that's why we've really been pumping it the last um, couple of days about the recording being available after. And yeah, like I said, that's available via the um, Progressive Podiatry Project platform, which is a P3 for free subscription. And so I'm just admitting all the people that are coming through because my right hand man's not here to do it. Um, so happy for people to throw in the chat. Have a lot of you received the um, subjective history taking and the biomechanical assessment template? Yep, brilliant. Okay, so there will be a little bit that we're um, going to refer to as far as that goes. And then there'll be quite a few other things. So basically, um, for those of you that don't know us, um, so I'm Talisha Reeve, I've been a practicing podiatrist for 15 years, coming into my 15th year, and Jackson, who will be here shortly, he's been practicing for I think four or five years and he actually did placement with me I used to own a purely biomechanics and sports focus clinic in New South Wales on the mid north coast and I had that for I think seven years six or seven years um, and I had Jackson come and do placement with me in his final year and then basically we just aligned really well he came to work for me and then I sold the clinic he stayed on at the clinic and then over the last few years we've just developed this education platform and if you don't mind me it's Adelaide it's kind of hot I am having a beer um, so cheers now basically I'll just kind of run through what we're doing and I'm not sure how everything works in other countries but we've had quite a few people register from the UK and Ireland as well so I'm not really sure as far as if when we're referring to orthotic laboratories and bits and pieces like that what is available over there so we'll probably mention a few orthotic labs and a couple of things here that are probably yeah just known to Australians but if you have any follow-up questions afterwards um, like always, just email us through at p3podiatry at gmail.com. And sorry, there's just more people coming in. I need my right-hand man. Um, okay, so basically what we'll be covering tonight, so it's going to be pretty short, sharp and shiny because there's a lot we've tried to cram into the hour just because that's what we always do. So essentially we'll be talking about the musculoskeletal big four, which is essentially our history taking and communication, our objective assessments and functional assessments, exercise prescription and load management and orthoses. Footwear is that kind of comes into the load management equation and that's an entity unto itself. And yeah, we'd be here for six hours if we brought footwear into the equation as well. And then what we'll be covering off, so we'll do the big four and then we'll, and I talk with my hands a lot so we get used to that. What we'll be covering as far as the main points, as far as what they can't teach you at uni, that's not to say that universities fall short in what they do teach you because there's only so much you can cram into a three or four year degree right but there's a lot of things that come from experience and oftentimes learning the hard way where a large portion of that is especially when you're a new graduate you kind of well you are essentially but you do feel very much like you are at the bottom of the food chain and oftentimes that gets taken advantage of immensely and it I've seen so many people, even myself, I dropped out of the profession, um, I think I was four years out to work in a coffee shop because I just had not the greatest experience initially. So there's quite a few um, insights and experiences that Jackson and I have had over the 
last few years, and even with some of the people that we mentor, um, just some tips and tricks to kind of help set you up for being able to back yourself and kind of align if you want to have a career that's a bit more sustainable. So some of the things that we'll be covering as far as what they can't teach you at uni is sort of learning to say no more than yes. And that, again, comes into the feeling like you're at the bottom of the food chain. Um, and as far as communication with patients and even referrers and GPs and whatnot, the power of saying, I don't know, and the power of a referral, um, how to value your time and why that's very important. And um, one thing that, um, yeah, Jackson and I both, is don't be afraid to leave a contract so that's one of the things when you're especially a new grad um, sometimes you feel that maybe the first job that you've had you might feel like you're a little bit locked into it and you're a bit terrified to leave if it's not suiting you um, so we'll cover off a little bit of that and also when you're applying for jobs not just you going for an interview you actually should be interviewing your interviewers because it's not all just about what you can do for them it's also about what they can do for you and then what we've had quite a we had about 45 questions come through so we picked kind of the most common themed ones and so if we get well we'll, we'll get time to it just depends on how quickly we end up talking is um, a little bit about mentoring. So that's one question and answer, and we'll go into some of the specific questions with that when we get there. Um, there was sort of a few questions that came through as those that are a bit more familiar with Jackson and I and the platform that we have and how we've become specialists in that field. So I don't know how um, podiatry specifically works overseas, but in Australia, we're not specialists, we're just podiatrists. We have special interests and that's just come from, yeah, basically following what interests us and intrigues us. And obviously, if you guys are joining this webinar, then musculoskeletal is an area that you have an interest in as well, which is fantastic. So hopefully we can give you a little bit of information as far as what will help you sort of build your career if you want that sort of specialist or niche is probably a better way to explain it, um, niche market for yourself and the branding that comes with it. And then one of the last things, which I don't think it matters if you're a new graduate or you've been practicing for 15, 20, 30 or 40 years, how do you stay on top of the current literature? Because there's just so much and trying to consume it all. So how to do that in an efficient way? Um, so people can just throw in the chat box. Based on that, do any of you have any questions so far? you about five more seconds okay no questions for that now okay so what we'll tackle first up is the um sorry there's more people coming in hopefully jackson gets here soon because it's a bit hard jumping between two screens okay so with the history taking and communication, so when it comes to the clinical consultations and a lot of you from what I've gathered from the communications that we've had are coming into practice next year, you've just finishing uni this year, but there are a few that have been practicing for say 12 or 12 months, two years. Um, now the history taking and communication, especially when you're dealing with musculoskeletal complaints. And when I'm talking about this, it's more the realm of the chronic ones it's a little less different um a little less different a little more different when we're talking about acute injuries because oftentimes their kind of mechanism of injury tissue healing response rehab program they're oftentimes very much done and dusted when you've got those ones that are a little bit more chronic and insidious in nature that's where it's a little bit more difficult to manage and the importance of the history taking and communication becomes really really apparent um, so if some of you have registered after, because that email sequence was set a few weeks back, so those of you that haven't received the subjective history taking information, you will get that in about 15 minutes after the webinar finishes. So we're, when we're doing a subjective history taking, this is where it comes into it and it's so important and it doesn't have to just be the first appointment, it's right throughout the consultation process. 
taking the time to listen to the patient is so supremely important because oftentimes, especially in those chronic presentations, and the literature does does support this a lot more as well in recent times, is sometimes, well, what Laura Mosley, he's a pain specialist in Adelaide, his sort of thoughts and published works on chronic pain is the longer pain has been present for, the less it actually has to do with the tissue structure. So that's where we end up with more of those central and peripheral sensitizations coming into play. So taking the time during, especially that initial consultation, or if you've got a patient that you've marked with some flags, which I'll tackle in a second, um, taking the time to get a little bit more information as far as the nature of their pain and just what else is happening in their life, that will actually allow you to paint a better picture of what you can do treatment-wise. Because like I said, there's so many times that the pain presentation oftentimes doesn't have anything really to do with the tissue. So in the last few years, there's been a couple of papers published as far as a potential link between central sensitization and plantar heel pain presentations and Achilles tendinopathy print. God, I can't talk presentations. So with that and going into um, the whole presentations of pain, that's very much beyond the scope of the hour that we have. But when we take the time to ask the questions, we can identify a few key factors. And what some of the key factors that you want to tackle are, uh, why are they seeking your help? And this is where we're linking it into. So as a podiatrist, we may be going, okay, they have low tissue tolerance for that particular structure. We need to build that. Oftentimes that doesn't mean much to a patient. They may be coming in to see you because they can't walk through the grocery store without pain. And that's what they want to be able to do. So basically getting an idea of what they're coming in for, for the presentation, um, or, and that gives you a target that you want to achieve. So you can identify your goal and then, okay, asking them, what do you think is wrong? And the, all those questions like that, which is again, what that um, resource will sort of guide you with. So what are their expectations? What are their fears? What do they think are, is wrong? Because that will set you up with what you physically are aiming for. Are there any potential barriers that you've identified? Like, do they need a little bit more education around what pain actually is and some reframing of what's actually happening? And then some barriers especially those I, I don't know well a lot of people don't know but I've also worked as a case manager in workers compensation and that's one area that if you're a podiatrist or any allied health practitioner in general treating a workers compensation injury that's musculoskeletal in nature you'll find that they're the presentations that you really, really want to take in a lot of the history taking and what's going on subjectively, because that's where a lot of the orange, blue and um, yellow flags may come into play. So yellow flags are psychosocial factors, orange flags are psychological factors, like depression, anxiety, and then blue flags are occupational factors. So if they're not getting on with their boss, they don't like their job, because you may have a patient that you're treating and you're doing everything absolutely correct but they're not able to get back to work oh I'm still in pain is it because they're actually in pain or is it because they don't want to go back to work because they don't like their boss or something like that so taking the time to elicit that information from the patient is so immensely important and oftentimes especially in the initial presentation when it's a chronic one that will actually paint you a picture of what the next steps will be. So some people get a little bit disillusioned by, okay, in the first consultation, I have to do something. I've got to do a whole heap of dry needling or massage or scan for orthoses or do everything like that. A lot of the times, like I said, especially in the chronic ones, because they're the ones you will find more tricky, you just sit down, ask those leading questions and gather as much information as humanly possible so you can basically build the framework of what you need to address treatment wise. And then that leads into the objective assessments and functional assessments. So oh, Jackson, you are here. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, thanks for waiting. Um, yeah, uh, that's all right. I was 
jumping between the double screens. So we've been going for, yeah, maybe 15 minutes. So I've just covered the introduction. So everyone who doesn't know Jackson, this is Jackson. Um, I've given them a rundown of who you are, how we met, and that you had a last minute patient. Bit of a bit of a backstory, yeah, 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 yeah. That's no, good. I had just had a really interesting patient, so um, yeah. Thanks for being patient. Some bit bit behind schedule. Oh, all good. Um, it's just mean I've had to go slow on my beer. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't have any. I've just come straight from work, so I forgot, to, I forgot to bring one with me. Would have been good. No, yeah, we'll do it on the weekend. <laughs> um. Yeah. So now well, we're literally just tackling the big four. So now we're moving on to the objective assessments and the functional assessment. And then this is again where that resource we've sent you all. And again, if you haven't received it, you will receive it after 15 minutes after this webinar concludes. With oftentimes as a new grad, and it takes quite a lot of exposure or experience to gather the information. So I'm doing this test and then linking that to potentially what the presentation is and then linking that to what the treatment will be. So being able to, um, if you can just gather the information, especially if you've got a mentor or someone else that you can process, or even if it's just yourself practicing, if you're able to gather as much information as humanly possible objectively, well, especially via that template, if you find it helpful, that's the most important thing at that point in time because the patient oftentimes is going to be coming back for a review. So even if you're not exactly sure what the next steps may be, if you've got as much information as humanly possible and you may do one or two small things in the initial consultation, then you've bought yourself a little bit of time to sit down and synthesise the information and get a little bit more of a plan happening. So that's why we've given you those two resources to start with, because the more information you can gather, because though that's the information that you can only get when the patient is sitting in front of you. You can't really, it's not super professional to call them the next day and go, oh, I forgot to ask you this. Can you just um, run through X, Y, Z with me? So if you can gather all that information and then potentially highlight maybe one or two things that are the most important that you may address, whether or not it's... Um, yeah, one or two basic exercises or it's just some education or just, yeah, rebooking them in a day or two to, yeah, run through what your findings are. Um, it just buys you that time to, yeah, take stock, process, get a little bit of a plan and because it even happens to us that have been practising for a few years, sometimes you can have a massive curveball come in, especially if you've had patients running late and you're just all over the shop, just gathering as much information then stopping taking stock after the appointment when you've addressed a little bit of what's needed to just fulfil that patient need, then you can tackle it with a lot more composure and more of a plan at the next consult. Definitely, I'd agree with that. I reckon the, um, the assessment, uh, you're talking about the biomechanical assessment template we sent them? Yep. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, that, that's um, really, really helpful. Uh, as a new graduate, I found following a template like that super helpful. Um, got my hands-on skills up. Um, I was sort of new, the sort of thing, the tests, got really familiar with the tests. And then as you develop a bit more confidence in bringing it all together, um, you, you can start to tailor the assessment to the individual a little bit more. Um, so yeah, you don't have to always follow that rigid template for every single biomechanical client. Although that's what I did, definitely did really early on, but I eventually I found that that sort of did my head in and, um, you, yeah, you can learn to tailor the assessments a little bit, a little bit more. Um, but yeah, definitely having a template to follow something to refer back to is really, really helpful, um, to make sure you're just not really, uh, missing anything as far as the objective assessments. Yeah, that's it. And that's, again, where after you've had a lot more exposure to people and feet and knees and the rest of the body, you'll be able to link, okay, the subjective history, they've told me X, Y, Z. So then objectively, I need to look at ABC. Mm -hmm. And then you link it from there. But initially, in being able to learn how to form those links, going through the process for almost everyone, if you can, if you have time, that's kind of what will sort of fast track a lot of that linking. Okay, if they're saying this, then I need to look at this and then we'll come into the exercise prescription and orthoses part with the big four. Um, yeah, so hopefully that wraps that up. Now, after we've covered those two, in the chat box quickly, I'll give you all a chance. Anyone have any questions so far? 
it's really um it's really common uh i guess uh frustration or confusion that we can, we get with with new graduates is is what test do i need to be doing and and or you know or why am i doing this test that's it's really um yeah something that i, I definitely struggled with but just with more exposure and more more hands-on um testing and exposure to muscus clear clients that it just all started to make sense so um and then kind of definitely coming out of university you don't have that exposure it's just that's just the re- the reality of it you um and you you learn by doing so just get your hands on yep and that's it the, even it, once you start practicing you probably won't have time but if you do have time it's even good sometimes to just sit down and you would have done it I'm sure going through your training but just any opportunity you can I remember when I was a new graduate I'd sort of go and visit the grandparents and my parents and I'd just run through a biomechanical full test with them if I could go hip to toe just to again get that exposure everyone gets sick of it after you've done it a few times to them but yeah running through that template hopefully that's really helpful and then So jumping into the third lot of the big four, which is exercise prescription. And this is where, well, actually as new graduates, no, I feel from what sort of the conversations Jackson and I tend to have with, um, well, just podiatrists in general, two of the most terrifying things are exercise prescription and orthoses. And I would actually say that it's probably in that order. I think there's a lot more focus on orthoses prescription at uni and just in general with podiatry versus exercise prescription. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you've got two key points that you would be able to give the new grads or or recent graduates as far as what you think is important for exercise prescription. Yeah, if we're talking about musculoskeletal podiatry, then obviously um, strength and exercise is going to be a big part of that um and unfortunately it's it's uh i don't think it's uh expanded on enough at at undergraduate level so um, as far as gaining more experience and confidence in exercise prescription number one you just got to start doing it so start prescribing exercises to people um to your to your clients um no matter how big or small no matter what sort of client they are even your routine care clients that you may have more of um, to start off with, you, 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 there's no reason why you can't take them through um, a strengthening program. Um, you just got you just got to start somewhere. The more you start playing around with exercises and and prescription of exercises, the more feedback you get, which which really um, helps you. Like as much as you can read books, etc. Um, the, at the end of the day, you got to start doing it. Um, that's going to give you the most confidence. Um, and yeah, that's probably my biggest tip on that one. Um, second tip um just be keen to to learn in that area like upskill yourself so obviously there's the practical getting hands on and and exposure to it clinically but um you know if there is an opportunity to uh shadow someone or um, go and spend some time with a strength and conditioning coach um go and spend some time with another podiatrist who is more skilled in that area um go and uh, do an exercise prescription course um maybe uh you know you can read some books, etc. It, it all it all helps. So just really invest your time and energy into into improving that if if that's what you want to do and and yeah if that's where you want to take things with your practice. Um, just got to invest the time in it. Yeah, no, they're two good points. I agree with them. I'll throw to him, and you're leading about the upskill. I will do a short, sharp, and shiny. Um, yeah plug for the online course later on um but anyway with exercise prescription so there's kind of two things that i feel are quite important number one is especially when you're dealing with active patients sometimes it's not giving them something sometimes the most important thing that you need to do is actually remove something so an exercise prescription for one person may be do less of this So a lot of the times we um, can kind of feel like we've got to give them something. So if you've got, for instance, say someone with Achilles tendinopathy or plantar heel pain, that they may be able to run seven kilometres and that's fine, but then they've decided they want to start training for a half marathon and they've upped their mileage by five or six kilometres a week and that's giving them pain. Giving them like high load strength training for the plantar fascia and or Achilles, depending on what the presentation is, 
that may actually be adding more load on top of it and exacerbating the problem. So if they go, oh, well, I can run seven kilometres and I'm fine, but as soon as I get up to the 12Ks, I pull up really sore or 14 kilometres. So literally for some patients, all you need to do is, and this is again where it comes into the history taking, asking them what they're doing, how much they've increased things by and et cetera. Um, yeah, sometimes it may be, okay, well, maybe you don't need to do any extra exercises. Maybe we just need to increase your load a little bit slower or space out the days that you're doing it. If they were doing, say, Monday, Tuesday, and then having Wednesday off, maybe they'd benefit from going Monday, have Tuesday off and then running on Wednesday. So that's one of yeah the things I find is really important is don't fall into the illusion or buy into the illusion that you always have to give a musculoskeletal pathology an exercise. Sometimes you just need to reduce the load on that tissue. So that's probably one of the biggest factors. And then the other one is unless you're dealing with... so. Dealing with, if you've got someone that's got um, a chronic musculoskeletal pathology, that's sort of one area. And then if you've got someone that you're trying to achieve a specific tissue goal, like strength or hypertrophy, that's another area. And then you've got performance that's sort of another realm. Now, when you're getting into the performance side of things, that's where the sets and reps are a lot more scripted. So that, um, that I don't know if many of you would have heard of like the chronic interference hypothesis. So that's where sets and reps, so if you've got higher um, set numbers, um, not set numbers, repetition numbers, then that's more metabolically demanding. If you've got lower repetition numbers, but it's a higher load when you're doing it, that's more neurologically demanding. Mm -hmm. So what happens with that is if you've got someone that you're training for performance, you do actually need to be a little bit more particular with the sets and repetitions that you prescribe because that can have an impact on their performance. So let's say you give someone four sets of 12 repetitions, they may actually perform worse the next day when they're trying to do a, say, time trial run. But if you give them, say, five sets of three repetitions and it's more a power-focused exercise, that may not have any deleterious impact on their performance. So that's a performance end of the spectrum. And then when it comes down to the other end of the spectrum, when we're dealing with people that it's more that chronic pain, the magic number of sets and reps, it doesn't really matter. And that's where, um, so there's another pain resource that it's available on the website, but you will get that as a follow-up in a couple of days. That's where you use the actual like pain scale. So well, it's the VAS, Visual Analog Scale of Pain, or RPE, Rate of Perceived Exertion. You'll use that as what your guide will be for their um, set and rep number. So, for example, if you've got someone with plantar fasciopathy and you give them the stock standard three sets, 10 repetitions, that may blow the pain levels completely out of the water. And then they go, okay, these exercises aren't for me. I'm not going to do it. It didn't help me. And then I'll go off and yeah, find some snake skin oil salesman and they'll give me something that also won't help. That's where you can go, okay, well, if you say you're, and this is where that info sheet will come in handy because it's got all the info on there, but say they go to start their exercises at their pain, maybe a one or two out of 10, and then they get to say the sixth repetition and then the pain jumps to a four or five out of 10. Okay, stop at that level. Once that pain level jumps up, stop at that number of repetitions, you're done. And especially with those people with those chronic pain presentations, it will fluctuate. So some days they may only be able to do three repetitions if they've had poor sleep, a fight with their husband, if their stress levels are up, their pain sensitivity might be up as well. So for those people, using their body and that internal feedback for how many sets and reps they should do is oftentimes the guide that you need for that. So that's my two points for the exercise prescription. Yeah, and just don't, don't be afraid to stuff up either. Like you, you're going to flare people's pain up. Um, yeah, you can't kill someone. I still, I, I, still, I still do it every day. I, I had a, a person today who came back and told me the prescription I gave them was no good. So um, <laughs> and they, they've flared their knees and their hip up. So um yeah we just you just got to be comfortable with that and the only way to get comfortable with that is to is practice is just, just start doing it and then you become more exposed to those scenarios and you know how to adjust on the fly um and it's like anything and that's that's probably a good segue into orthosis as well like um 
again, at, at, uh, at university, you probably don't get much exposure to actually prescribing orthotics for patients. Um, like you, I know you do like a unit or two on orthoses, but um, yeah, as far as the day in day out prescription for clients, um, yeah, you're going to, you're going to stuff up along the way um, and are definitely a lot more early on until you find your feet and um, yeah, and it's fine. It's just part of the, part of the learning process um, as much as you don't, you never want to do any harm to anyone, but um, at the end of the day, you've got to try new things, et cetera, with scripts. And that's the only way to learn. Um, and that's the best way to learn. I found with both ex exercise prescription and orthoses, just, just start doing it um, and, and make, make mistakes hundred percent. Yep. And that's it. It doesn't matter how, yeah, what stage of your career that you're in, you will make mistakes. So get comfortable with that because yeah, like 15 years later, there's still times I'll prescribe something and they come back and it's not great. It's just the nature of when you're dealing with individuals, everyone's different. So I think, um, yeah, well, one tip from Jackson as far as orthoses, just do it. Um, my One of my tips I would be is if you have an orthotic lab that you use, so, and this is where I was saying right at the start that I'm not sort of familiar with what orthotic laboratories are in the UK and whatnot, but there's been quite a few that I've used here in Australia. And just building a really good relationship with your orthotic lab, like most of the time, well, actually every experience I've ever had, the podiatrists on the other end of the phone or the orthotic techs on the other end of the phone are more than happy to help. If you run through, okay, I've got someone with X, Y, Z, and I'm thinking about this, this, and this for their orthotic script, what do you think? Oftentimes I'll talk you through it. And most of the time they've got the time. And if they don't, they'll call you back. So um, like virtual orthotics, Queensland orthotic lab and footwork lab, um, footwork laboratories, I've used three of them predominantly um, and there's a few others that exist. And I know that a few of the other ones that yeah. exist like Paramed and that they've got um, really good reputations. It's just, there's only so many orthotic labs you can use, right? Mm. Um, but yeah, so one of my tips would be, don't be afraid to ask questions and just get familiar with the text. Like even as soon, if you started a practice, just give them a call. Okay, this is my name. I work at this clinic. Just build a little bit of a rapport with the text and then they'll help sort of step you through a couple of those tricky orthosis scripts. This is actually something that I'm, I'm having an issue with right now, actually, with one of our um orthotic labs that we use and, and it's because i haven't done that so i've actually um i've actually been on the phone uh this week to the owner of the orthotic lab and he's, he's going to come out to the clinic and um sit down with me for a couple of hours and, and go through um their process and and what they do and give me some show me some samples of all different things because i was having some issues because uh, i work at a couple of different clinics um and yeah this clinic i'm at at the moment like i've had some good success with their orthotics but i've started to um, do some different scripts for different people and they haven't come back quite exactly how i would expect and i haven't really got the results so um and that was because i haven't uh haven't done that haven't established that relationship so um yeah so it's uh yeah coincidence that you've <laughs> brought that That's up a good point. yeah and it does so uh, don't be afraid to ask them if you can come out. So Jackson just said that they're going to come out to his clinic, but that's one thing. Probably even, better, probably even better if I was to go to them. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Like with, I've um, been to virtual orthotics in Sydney when um, I was prescribing through them footwork lab in Melbourne, Tony Dwyer here in Adelaide. So the, like, and especially when it's your baby, like, of course, you love sort of showing it off and explaining people. That's what happens when you're passionate about it, right? That's why Jackson and I are here doing this. Um, yeah, so if building upon, yeah, just having a good relationship with them, oftentimes, if it's feasible, especially with COVID and depending on whether or not you order from an international supplier, if you can get to the actual orthotic lab itself, just to learn sort of how they do things and what you will find is one thing that I very much learned is what one orthotic lab. So you may say on orthotics on an orthotic script, think you're doing the same prescription, mm -hmm. but it may come out quite differently. So that's just because everyone's got their different way of doing things, different manufacturer processes. And even if you're say using um, a labs using 3d milling versus 3d printing, 
then even how it's constructed can be quite different when you ask for certain dimensions and things like that. So definitely sort of talk them through and ask questions like, okay, if I've got someone that may weigh X amount of kilograms or they've got this condition, like how much sort of thickness wise, that's probably one of the biggest things that you'll find. So um, a two mil thick device from one place may be quite different to somewhere else so some labs I found that a two mil type at their lab was almost the equivalent of a four mil somewhere else so yeah talk to the labs that would be my biggest thing when it comes to orthoses and just give it a go yeah and and same with exercise prescription as well with and orthoses I reckon um, my final tip on that would be uh, keep it simple um, so just keep everything really simple don't try to do a crazy fully customized script for every single client that comes in um because you're just uh yeah you just you'll just do your head in um so keep your keep your scripts um fairly generic um because in in my opinion like if you if the the orthotic is made for that person's foot and it's um it's it's already it's already customized so um the the, as far as the additions you put into into the orthotic um keep them simple don't go crazy adding all sorts of posting and and flanges and and additions and pour on and cushioning and all that um just keep it really simple you can always add um but when you when you make it really complex and fully customized and then it's, it's not working and it doesn't achieve the outcome you you're hoping for you've sort of got nowhere to go with it as well um so and and same with your exercise description don't come up with crazy hectic um exercises um just keep everything really simple squats i think that, yeah yeah both of squats on a swiss ball um uh, what else? Any sort of circus tricks, any ladder drills or anything like that. Just just keep keep it simple. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and definitely for your orthotics. Yeah, I actually, like, I don't want to chew up too much time on that point, but that's one thing that is a really, really good point and what I would find with patients. So a lot of the time you'll come across patients that they may come in with a whole bag of orthoses. And if they've had bad experience after bad experience and there's been a few sort of knowledge gaps or treatment gaps that haven't been filled in where it may be load management and footwear that they needed, not $800 worth of orthotics, um, what I would often do is instead of maybe doing a new script, I would just modify the orthotic and what, yeah, I would always say is, and it's very much true, if the orthoses contours to the arch quite well, you can still modify the living daylights out of them. So yeah, that's where if you put in a ton of extra additions that may not be necessary and you're going a little bit rogue with it, it can limit the sort of potential to adjust them later on down the track if you do need to fine tune them. So just having something that contours quite well um, and then doing external postings and additions after the fact, that can often be a good thing instead of having the intrinsic postings. So and that even goes with me, um, medial scribes and lateral scribes. You can build them out of high density EVA instead of having them built into a poly or 3D printed shell. Sure. But That's that good. would be wrapping up the orthotic part of it. Yeah, yeah. It's good. All right. So we're going to launch into a couple of the things that what they can't teach you at uni. Awesome. Um, you're more of a well you were more of a yes man than <laughs> well more recently so i'll let jackson jump into the first one which is learning to say no more than yes yeah i think um so this is this whole section that we're going to go through now in the webinar is uh about uh some some things that you can't learn at university so it's not that they don't teach you them because they they just don't it's more that, that you can't learn this stuff without having clinical experience so um and 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 as far as your career as well so um the the difference between saying no and saying yes to things and opportunities jobs um etc um cpd events things you know choosing which way to sort of take your career etc um early on as a new graduate and and this led me uh this led me to where i am today so i'm very happy with uh, and that's a place that I'm very comfortable with and, and, and happy with my progress in my career so far. Um, and that was, I used to say yes to a lot of opportunities. So, um, yeah, whether it was doing something sort of some sort of volunteering role at a football club or, um, you know, going to that extra training, um, doing that extra webinar, um, you know, 
I used to say, yes, yes, yes. There was, there, there would be things come up. My employers would ask me to do something and I would agree to it because I, you know, it was an opportunity to learn opportunity to try something new uh, and saying yes along the way throughout my early career, um, which is still early, but um, in the first couple of years was really, really helpful because it, it got me exposure to all different things. So, um, which was really good. And then, so I think if you're trying to sort of, if we bridge it back to uh, musculoskeletal podiatry in general, if you want to direct your career down that pathway, um, any sort of opportunities that come up um, that present to you that, that, that would achieve that or help achieve that for you, then say yes to them. Absolutely. Say yes to any opportunities that come your way that progress you further towards your goal. And then as you sort of start to get a little bit more comfortable and a little, little bit more of a direction as to where you want to take your career, you can learn to say no to things. And that's something that uh, I'm trying to do uh, at the moment a lot more. I've found that there's some, been some opportunities come up as far as um, jobs and, and you, know, um, you know, different courses and things that I see it and I'm like, oh, I'd love to do that. Um, but uh, and then I have a think about it for a few more seconds and I'm like, oh no, that's probably not appropriate right now. Um, so um, yeah, say yes early on, like as new graduates, definitely yes, um, really, really important to create opportunities for yourself. And um, I think that's really important. Um, but then, you know, as you start to understand where you want to take your career and then you can learn to um, say no to things a little bit more. I think it's dangerous to say no to things early on um, uh, unless, unless you're very clear on what your, um, yeah, what your sort of direction is and whether something takes you, uh, closer or further away from your, your goals, whatever they may be. Um, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. That makes really good sense. I think that's helpful. And so I think career wise, fantastic. Um, the other realm in which you'd want to say no more than yes is, sorry, I've lost a light. Um, and this is what you can do right from the start of your career is what a lot of people find. This is where we find a lot of, um, well, it's not just podiatrists, allied health in general have that burnout at the couple of year marks. So you might get two or three, four years into it and they just burn out and leave the profession. And that is where the work-life boundary, I don't think it's work-life balance. I think it's a work-life boundary um, where that becomes blurred and overstepped. So if you're being asked to work hours that are in excess of what you want to do or you've got, and this happens so much and I still struggle with it, where you kind of feel that guilt like, oh, I'll just cram one more patient into my lunch break. I'll just oh, I'll work one or two extra hours today just so I can see them. You can only sustain that for so long before it starts to have a really negative impact on everything else outside of life. So early on in your career, like pretty much right from the word go, when you're looking at it from a self-care perspective, um, don't put, yeah, ba other people before you. Like it's realistically, no one is going to die from if you don't see them on that particular day in musculoskeletal podiatry. It's not going to happen. They may not be happy with it, but if it's going to take Add, well, if it's going to take something away from you, if it's going to add stress, take time away from recreational activities you like doing, if you're going to miss out on your after work activities like playing sport or anything like that, just be very conscious of not creating a habit of saying yes too often um, because you feel like, oh, I've got to please everyone because it really does lead. It's a fast track to burnout. And I've seen, I've experienced it and I have seen so many people that have left and they haven't come back. And it's just because they've said yes all the time to everyone, to everything. So I think career-wise, Jackson's point is perfect. And then from a self-care perspective, I would say just being quite self-aware of your stress levels, how much you can tolerate, and don't put yourself second to life and things that you can enjoy. Because at the end of the day, patients are probably not going to do the same for you. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next up, the power of saying, I don't know. Yeah, this is cool. Um, so as a, as a new graduate, obviously there's a lot of stuff that you don't know and that's, um, that's just how it is. Once you start practicing, you start to realize um, that, you know, university didn't teach me everything. They sort of just laid the, the foundations and um, the more stuff you start to learn along the way as far as musculoskeletal podiatry, um, you um, begin to realize what you don't know and then there's even more that you don't know that you don't know yet so um, 
it's it's you'll often have a client come in and you don't know what the diagnosis is. Um, so you can't give them a diagnosis. And, um, and I literally just had that right before. That's why I was running late. It was, it took a little bit more, um, explanation and, and I, I don't have a diagnosis for this client. I was just sort of explaining the process of a plan of where I would take their, their management, but I, I can't give them a diagnosis cause I just don't know. Um, so I just gave them a general diagnosis, um, and a general way of, progressing forward and they were quite happy with that so as long as you're confident in delivering that message so um you can you can be confident and have confidence in saying that you don't know and that comes across as you actually being very knowledgeable uh if if that makes sense yeah i think that's a very good point and it is true because a lot of the times we don't know and it's that whole like you don't need to baffle someone with bs if you don't know and it's the same as even with the diagnoses like it doesn't always have to be something like you've got achilles tendinopathy because of xyz it can be you've just done a little bit too much and your tendons a little bit annoyed like that's as far as it needs to go and that's where it kind of leads into another thing the power of saying i don't know if you have confidence even in saying i don't know but i have a colleague who they're more experienced in this this and this how about i get in touch with them and the next time i see you i'll have i'll have a few more answers for you so that's one way that you can approach it and every time i've done that i honestly think every time i've done that um everyone the patients that I've been talking to have been really responsive, appreciative, and then we've come back on deck with the next appointment and had a more strategic game plan in place. And then the other thing is if you don't know, you can always refer. So you don't always have to own the patient or their problem or anything like that. If you know that there's someone out there that will handle their condition better or be able to treat them better or just be more suited to them you can always refer you don't be scared to do that so it's because again a good referral is just as good as a good treatment so you're better off if you know someone that's more experienced with it that even if you say um converse with a colleague they may give you some information but if you know that there's someone else that's 100 percent going to be better for that person you can refer them on because that's what's best for them. It's not really what's best for sort of our metrics and the pocketbook of us at the end of the day. Yeah. And if you start making stuff up as well, like if you sort of fake it till you make it as far as um, your, your diagnosis and the, and the treatment plan, you, you get found out eventually. So I think that fake it till you make it is sort of like the worst piece of advice anyone could give you. Um, you, 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 eventually somewhere that you, you, the client's going to see that you're not quite sure. It might be, it might not be in something you say, but it might be uh, body language or um, just the overall vibe of the consultation. Like you're going to, if you, if you're uh, yeah, if you're making stuff up, that's going to, it's going to show. So just be confident in, in not knowing um, and, and it, it display that confidence and, and that gives them confidence, even though you don't um, really know the answers. <laughs> Yep, and it, it works. <laughs> like, it really does. Um, so coming up to the next, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit more with the saying no, um, is valuing your time. And Jackson is better at time management than myself. So I'll let Usually, you not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, uh, as far as valuing your time, and this is really important when it comes to musculoskeletal podiatry, because you tend to need more time in consultations, obviously. Um, so, um, yeah, you can't really manage someone who has a chronic, uh, pain related issue in, in 20 minutes. So, um, you need to give them enough time, obviously, but then also, uh, yeah, value your time, uh, in the consultation as well. So make sure that you, um, as much as you can try not to run over time. Um, and so if, if, and that comes down to prioritization, I think. So if someone had comes in and they've got three, four, five different issues, aches and pains, you get yourself in trouble when you try to fix all of those things at once. So uh, I think it's really important that you prioritize and actually ask them what's most important to you um, right now. And that all of those pains and issues may all be related and it may be a common uh, plan to fix all of them at once. Um, or they may be completely separate issues. So they've got a forefoot pain, but they've got Achilles on, on the other side. 
um, and they've got knee pain on the other side, like it might be, okay, what's, what's the biggest issue right now? And it might be their Achilles. So that's when you know you need to focus all of your time in that consultation. And you, say, and you just ask them, okay, is this okay if we spend most of today on this? Because it's obvious that this is the biggest issue. And then the other things we can address next time. Uh, and, and there's no harm in actually asking someone to come back for another consultation like the next day. And I've done this, I've done this plenty of times. Um, where they've come in for a comprehensive assessment and there's just literally so much going on that we've needed more time uh, and I've actually booked them in like the next day for a further assessment, um, which might sort of, uh, yeah, weird some people out, but it's, it, it just comes down to valuing your time. And I think that actually, that actually shows to them that you are uh, confident and determined to, to help them and that, and that you know the, the limitations and you're not just trying to run around and fix everything like you're not you're not going to be frantic they're already frantic with all of their their issues so you're actually giving them the calm and confidence that that they need and you're giving them the boundaries of the time and being like look this is this consultation we've got time to work on this uh, let's focus on this and then tomorrow we'll do some more assessments on this or you know next week or whatever yeah, that's a really good point and having the confidence in doing that. And I do think they are appreciative. And so one um, point that I'll tap into, not for that, we'll go on to the next one, is don't be afraid to leave a contract. So the first job I had when I left uni, I think I lasted for maybe two months and it was something that it was what was promised on paper versus what it actually was, was vastly different. And I was just an emotional train wreck. And when I gave my notice, it was, well, you've signed a contract for 12 months. You can't leave. You can. It's <laughs> um, like, don't be scared of doing that. If something is not good for what your career aspirations are, if it's not a good fit for you just in general, if it's not good for your mental health, if it's not good, if it's not fitting and aligning with what you need, um, because like our God, friendships, our romantic relationships, we all have needs that need to be met. It's exactly the same with work. Um, if the job is not meeting your needs, that you need to either be... Um, sort of mentally stimulated enough or emotionally fulfilled, whatever the need is that you need to be met, if it's not meeting it, you can always leave a contract. It's There's always going to be nuances in a contract, but don't be scared of doing that because, yeah, it's that's another reason that leads to people leaving the profession because they feel like they're married into this contract that they can't get out of and then they just go, well, I'm not going to leave and work somewhere else, I'm just going to leave. Um, yeah. Dietary is a great profession, so if we can keep you here, that's better. Yeah, particularly if you if you are someone who's wanting to direct your career down the musculoskeletal route and sports podiatry, etc. Uh, and if you're not in a role where that's going to be possible, like it's always possible, you can always make things happen. But there are going to be some roles that are less likely for that to happen than others. So you know, if an opportunity comes up and you're only a couple of months into your contract, but an opportunity comes up at a sports podiatry clinic, then take it like what, what do you you don't you don't owe anyone anything there's no um yeah well it's a it's it's a funny one and I, I found it really hard to leave my first job um I, I was on a you know I was going really well and um it was a good that wasn't me by the way no it wasn't Talisha um but um the the uh Talisha left me um but the <laughs> the uh opportunity to continue in my in my role there was was good um but you know, there was just other things come up for me that I was like, oh no, this I need to need to take this next step, and I had to leave my contract twelve months early. For I was contracted for for two years, and I left after twelve months. Um, it was it was really difficult. It was awkward, but I just had to do it. And and the, and um, yeah, don't be afraid to do it. You hear all the time that you need to commit twelve uh, two years or something like that to to a contract uh, out of loyalty. But like you know. Yeah, you got to you've got to live your life and and project your career where you want it to go. So if, if the current role you're in is boring you to tears, then you need to you need to um, do something about it. Yep. And then that comes into when you're actually applying for jobs, um, interviewing your interviewers, because again, like I touched on right at the start, is it's not just about what you can do for them; it's also about what they can do for you. Um, so. Jackson, he's, I've basically worked for myself and I've been an employer for quite a long time. Um, so you've probably got a little bit more insight as far as the interview, your interviewers. 
Yeah, I think just um, asking about opportunities to grow and in the in the musculoskeletal space, just making sure that that's definitely going to be an opportunity for you in that in that clinic that you are going to be able to see sports podiatry patients because that's the only way to learn and build your confidence in that area is to have exposure to those patients. So um, you need to make that very clear that you that's what you want and um, that you need to be given the opportunity to, to do that um, right from the get-go. So um, just make sure all of those things are very clear and, and tell them what your wants and needs and uh, goals are with your career and, and what your interests are. And if it's sports, but actually musculoskeletal stuff, then um, you need to ask a lot of questions what, when you're going for that job to make sure that's what you're going to get exposure to. Um, and don't be afraid to sort of just, yeah, be a bit patient as well as far as finding a job. Um, you don't have to just take the first one that comes along. You can um, yeah, find one that's going to be right for you. Yep. And like, that's a, another good point um, because like, of course we do have instances where financially we may have a little bit of stress, but there's always opportunities to say do locum work. And if you do need to have that sort of financial kickstart, there's a lot of flexible options for locum work, nursing home and aged care facilities. Um, so being able to, if you do need to sort of pay some bills whilst you're looking for that sort of more perfect full-time role or part-time, whatever you're looking for. Um, yeah, like Jackson said, it's there's no harm in taking a little bit of time to find something that's more suited to you. You don't always have to jump into your first role. Um, actually, now that you've been talking, some of the interview your interviewers insights that I might have is it's very again very much like dating is if you when you're asking questions um it's kind of identifying those red flags and if you're even compatible like if just don't sort of um if you can like I said it's always easier in theory versus practice right um if you have someone that says okay we need you to work um these hours and they just aren't suited to you or you need to work on Saturdays and you love your Saturday sport if there's things like that that are not negotiable for you but they're also not negotiable for the employer like again you're just going to make yourself miserable and you're probably not going to last there too long if that's what's happening so if you kind of can go in and when we say interview your interviewers if you know what you need from a role so if you need to be mentally stimulated if you need that little bit more support or mentoring asking if you're actually going to get that because if you don't ask those questions and you get into the role and it's not for you you may feel again obligated and stuck to that contractual obligation which again you can leave um but yeah, asking the right questions, that will give you a lot more sort of wiggle room to figure out if it is actually the right pathway for you. And that does have a really big impact on how sort of happy and fulfilled you'll feel with the role itself. And that plays a big part into the longevity within the profession. 100% agree. So Basically, that covers off the bits and pieces that we were going through. And then we had um, a few questions that come, like I said, we had about 45 questions come through. And like I said, I took kind of the main themes out of there. So basically, um, the first one that we'll cover off is when people were asking, how did we become specialists? And like I said, I don't know how it is in the UK with the registration standards and everything, but in Australia, Jackson and I are specialists. We just have a special interest and that's where we've made our career decisions. That's where we've done our extra studies, like Jackson's doing his master's. I've done a postgrad in rehab as well. Um, he'll be more qualified than me, but that's okay. Um, so we've just with our learnings, we've kind of followed that path. We've taken opportunities that have followed that path. And then with even the P3, the brand that we've done, we've just followed that path. So we've just, we've followed our niche interests and that's kind of what set us up in that area. And that's the same as what happened in clinical practice when I opened the clinic. Um, and then where Jackson is at present with the clinics that he's working at, he's essentially just mostly musculoskeletal. And it's just about following your interests, being good at it, building your brand, um, which comes through social media channels, getting in front of your target audience or patients. Um, yeah, so doing that, that's pretty much what we've done. So it's not a, there are, you can become a credentialed, 
sports podiatrist in Australia, but that still doesn't make you a specialist. There's no specialist pathway. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, how do you, if you're a specialist in anything, it just means you, you know a lot about that topic or, um, but then <laughs> but the, more, the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. So, um, yeah, I don't know how to actually define a specialist, but, uh, yeah, I definitely would not consider myself one. I think that, uh, uh, like you said, we're just, we're just visible in this field because we really enjoy it and really, pas- really passionate about it. And we've, um, yeah, developed a bit of a, a niche sort of market. We've, uh, you know, promote ourselves and what we do. Um, so that's actually one of the biggest tips I give to new graduates that I mentor uh, is, uh become visible like like uh get yourself on, get yourself on social media that's probably the best way to do it these days it might not be for you but um, that's just one example um and you know get yourself in front of your target market um talk about sports podiatry if you want to find a job in sports podiatry like it's easy very easy to send an employer a link to your linkedin profile they're going to click on it and if you've got you know half a dozen posts talking specifically about orthotic prescription then that's going to do wonders versus someone who doesn't um if you if you if you're visibly able to show that you are interested in that area uh, and that you are actively participating in your growth and development in that area um through social media then um, you're going to have a a, a leg up over anyone else that applies for that position Um, so um yeah just just promote yourself and and um yeah get yourself in front of your target market and um get yourself in front of uh, sports dietary clients, you know, any opportunities you can have, uh, yeah. any opportunities, any opportunities you can have to turn uh, general clients into sports dietary clients as well. That, that helps. Um, so, yeah. Yep. And I do agree with that. And that's one thing that, so from a business perspective, building that sports podiatry niche was, I found very, very early on, like paid advertising, like paid Facebook ads or like newspapers don't exist anymore, but that's, they did back when I opened the clinic. Um, That paid advertising, you would get little to no return on it. But if you did a free talk, there were like walking groups, um, sporting clubs, anything like that. And it's not sort of selling, oh, come see me for this. If you just talk about something that you're passionate about, like, so for example, when we had the um, clinic in New South Wales, we ended up with the entire netball region, us being their sports podiatry provider. So basically any ankle sprain that happened for their 800 um, netballers would come into our clinic. And that came off the back of literally just doing some free information sessions on how to manage ankle sprain injuries acutely and then what the sort of rehab goals are. So it was just giving free information and setting yourself up as that kind of expert in that field. That's what generated it. And literally all it cost was a few hours of time putting the presentation together and then actually doing the presentation, answering a few questions. And then that was it. So it wasn't $800 on advertising. It was, yeah, about three hours of time. And it just built that relationship that last, well, I don't even know if it's still going with the clinic, but it lasted for quite a few years while we had it. Yeah, just put yourself out there and create opportunities for yourself. That's that's the best way to to uh, develop your uh, niche and, and expertise in the sports podiatry world. Yep. Now, sorry, I just sort of half cut you off then. That was my bad. Um, basically, another one that's actually really important and it's, it doesn't matter if you're a new graduate, you're probably more ahead of the game if you're a new grad versus a person that's been practicing for quite a while is how to stay on top of the current literature because there's so much and it just takes so much time to consume it all. So, um, Jackson, well, as far as social media goes, Jackson's got his little insight for this. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of information out there um, from all different sources with um as far as social media and that, and that's, uh, that's a really good thing. I reckon um, social media is pushing our profession forward in leaps and bounds. And that's what, that's what we need. Um, and cause that's just the way everyone consumes information these days. I'd, I'd much rather watch uh, or read an informative, uh, interesting social media post than tr- troll through literature for hours. So, um, and I think most would agree. So um, I think that uh, it's really important as well, though, that you don't, uh, you cut out, a lot of the noise with your social media accounts so um don't join way too many facebook groups don't follow way too many 
uh, accounts uh, on Instagram, etc. Of course, it'll just end up giving you conflicting information. If you can find sort of three or four really good sources of of uh, research or info on social media that you really uh, enjoy and you find insightful and and helps it gives you value into your clinical practice, then just follow those and don't follow every single one that pops up all the time. Um, because uh, I've, I've, I found that it got a bit uh, overwhelming and I, yeah, actually I just went through and did a big cull of my social media as far as people who I follow on Facebook, Facebook groups that I was in, I left them um, Instagram pages that I followed, I unfollowed them. And, and I, I find now that I've, um, when I, whenever I open up my Instagram, for example, um, I, I learn every single time there's like a new post from someone who I really follow and really value and it's informative and helpful. It's, it's not just trolling through a whole bunch of crap. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. It's, um, and what we'll do is one of the follow-up emails that'll come in a couple of days is we'll, I'll kind of go through my social media and Jackson will go through his and we'll just throw in a couple of the ones that we find bang for buck. And, but the reason we're not sort of going through it now is everyone's, like I said, there's a few hundred people that registered for this and everyone's kind of got their own interests. Mine are slightly different to Jackson's. So, and save time for everyone. So we're not rattling off too much information. Um, we'll just um, throw in a few links and you can go check out those pages. If you find that they align with what you're interested in, give them a follow. If they don't, don't, but yeah, you can over consume content and it can become a little bit overwhelming. Um, and I will do a little bit of a plug if we're talking about how we stay on top of the current literature is one of the things that we have noticed with, um, um, that's why the course was developed, like musculoskeletal podiatry, um, well, even, well, just exercise prescription in the realm of podiatry when we're studying at, at uni and even postgraduate trying to find courses and everything like that to collate the what the literature says tied in with patient presentations like it's very overwhelming so last year I launched exercise therapies in podiatric practice which basically just goes through the main musculoskeletal pathologies but right into the nuances of exercise prescription like we we're discussing right at the start of this the considerations that you may have for if you've you're targeting someone or prescribing for someone that is a runner and you don't want to impact on their performance to say a time trial run and you're doing that rehabilitation versus how you would prescribe for strength or hypertrophy for one patient if you're doing say Achilles tendon rehab and then for someone that's got a chronic pain presentation so it's not a big plug but um as one of the links that'll come through in the aftermath of the emails from here which will only be two or three over the next week um it will just have a link to a bit more information about that online course and with the version two that will be due for launch in the next couple of months it was meant to be launched a little while ago but 2021 has been 2021 so it's slightly delayed but it's almost there there's um it's approved by the British Journal of Sports Medicine and it's an Australian Podiatry Association endorsed course as well. So it will recognise your CPD points for that. But I'll stop banging on about that. You will get an email that'll just have a link that you can go and check out a little bit more of the information as far as that goes. Um, hmm. And then... And share, and, and share what you're, you're learning as well. So, um, you know, one thing that I do with, with most of my social media content, it's actually what I'm actually reading or learning at that point in time. Um, so I uh, just, just repurposed in or re regurgitated in my own words. So that's, I find that really, really helpful. Um, so if you're say, if you're, if you're reading a, a textbook or if you're reading a journal article, or if you're doing a course, summarize what you learn in that chapter or that course and, and, and uh, teach it to somebody else. And that somebody else in my instance is my social media account. So anyone, everyone and anyone um, try to uh, consolidate and, and summarize that information and put it in, put your own spin on it based on your experience and your sort of uh, filter, um, which, and everyone's filter is going to be different, but um, yeah, sort of changes that mindset or, or that uh, sort of process of consuming information all the time to actually you producing information and producing content. So you sort of become a teacher in your own right. Um, so, and that, that really helps to consolidate information in your own brain. If you can actually simplify it into a, into a post where you can teach other people about it, then you actually learn it a lot better. In, um, that's what I find anyway. 
Yeah, hundred percent. It is that learning by teaching. So, cause it's that whole saying, like, if you don't understand, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. Right. So if you say, get a little bit of information that you're like, okay, this is really, really good, but that's a bit of a word salad that the general population might not understand. And you want to create like an infographic or a social media post out of that. You spend some time working through that. And if you take a little bit of time to take that little bit of complex information and sit through it and then figure out how you can communicate that via an infographic or even just a little advert or something, whatever you're going to do with it, that process in itself will consolidate that learning so much faster than just reading and then waiting for the next patient to come through the door that may have that presentation for it. So um, that's how you can make things a little bit more efficient for yourself. So it's you're consuming information, but then you can also build your brand with that information and you're learning how to convey that information. So it kind of, that's how, well, we found personally, it's that bang for buck between learning and then being able to improve how you address patients and kind of fast track that entire process. Definitely. Cool. And then sort of the last big group of questions that we got, and we've just ticked over the hour mark, so we'll get booted off Zoom in a minute anyway. Um, there were a lot of questions that came in from mentoring and sort of one of the biggest ones, um, which I just picked one out of all the mentoring questions, was what type of format of ongoing mentoring do you think is helpful with future employers and at what intervals? And that's a little bit tricky because it varies so much. Um, so yeah. basically that's where it comes into, if we draw on, so the mentoring is basically the first step is sort of you figuring out what you need and what you want to get out of something. So if I've got a mentor, so I have a few mentors um, and then I mentor a few people, same with Jackson, he mentors a few people, he has some mentors. Um, if you kind of find out, well, get a little bit real with yourself, sort of what your maybe weaknesses are or what you want to improve in. Um, and then, again, that's where that LinkedIn and the networking comes into play really well. And it doesn't have to be within your clinic. It can be anyone from across the planet. Like that's the beauty about the internet, right, is if you find someone that's got a clinical interest that you feel that you resonate with, reach out to them and connect. And basically just by one, getting in touch with what you feel that your knowledge gap is or what skill set you want to improve on, identifying that and then just connecting with, with people. And then that'll kind of be your first step as far as the, for, well, not so much format, but the type of mentoring. And it just depends on where the person is. That'll sort of dictate what the mentoring format will be, whether or not it's Zoom calls, phone calls, in person. Um, any insight, Jackson? Yeah, just make sure, make, like, obviously, if you input, mentor is important. Um, and uh, if you're not getting it, do something about it. So um, either bring it up with your employer and say, look, I'd love to have some sort of structured mentoring system where we uh, meet up once a fortnight for an hour or once a week for half an hour, whatever, whatever it ends up being. It's going to be different for everyone, every, every clinic, every boss, every, every person's needs. So um, just have it structured, put in the diary, because if it's not in the diary, it's not going to happen because your employers, your potential mentors are, are busy. So uh, make sure it's blocked out of your clinico or whatever it is you use. Um, you've got a block there every single week for a catch up with your uh, mentor and, and have one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And that, that can, doesn't have, yeah, it can be anything. It can be a case case review or it can be a general topic of podiatry or it can be just life career stuff as well. Um, yeah, make sure you have it scheduled in because, uh, yeah, definitely with uh, musculoskeletal podiatry, it's really, really important uh, that you're constantly learning, learning from different sources, different mentors, not, you know, you don't just have to have one mentor like um, as much as, as good as Talisha was and, and is. I, I've, I've learned from uh, other people as well. So Talisha was my first boss, but I've had a couple since then as well. And, um, and they've all taught me different things. So a lot of, some of it, actually a lot of it is, con is, is different to what Talisha does. So, um, and that's been really helpful to me to develop to, to a point where I am now, where I sort of mold all of those ideas into my own style of practicing. I'm not just a, a clone of, of Talisha. Um, so, <laughs> and that leads into one of the other questions that we had, the, what are the characteristics of a good mentor relationship? And that is, it's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. So 
one, like a mentor and a mentee, they both need to get something out of it. So it's great with Jackson. So I learn a lot from him as well. So that's one characteristic that you need. So you, when you talk with someone, they've got to be getting something out of it as well. So it's a symbiotic relationship, not a parasitic one, right? Now, that's, and it just depends on, and a mentor, um, probably what the best thing to do, and a lot of really good mentors do this, is before they take you on as a mentor, they'll often have a conversation with you first up, just to identify whether or not you may be a good fit, because knowledge base wise you may be a good fit but personality wise you may not be a good fit because a lot of what happens with mentorships is they keep you accountable so if you personality wise can't take um a very constructive criticism like all the mentors i know they give a lot of constructive criticism um and feedback and everything like that. But if personality wise, you don't align with that person and you'll take it the wrong way, it's not a good fit and you won't get out of it what you need. So probably, um, yeah, um, that's the other thing, um, sort of going into a mentorship with an expectation that it's not just about you getting from someone. You do need to be accountable and you will also need to give into it. So you'll only get out of a mentor relationship what you put into it. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think most most clinics these days are starting to cotton on a bit that um, new graduates are looking for a structured mentorship program, uh, and that's what that's what I've got. Even though I'm not a new graduate, we, I've still got a structured mentorship program with my employers. Like we have a, a meeting every fortnight um, that's in the diary, and we know what we're going through for that meeting, etc. Um, it's mapped out. We've got goals that we want to tick with those meetings. So um, yeah, so I think that's really important to have. So if you if you don't have something like that. Um, yeah, just seek it elsewhere or try to put it in place. And that's communication is really important. Um, you just need to communicate with your employer. Look, I feel not feeling confident in this. Can you please help me? Uh, or they might be able to point if they're too busy because, um, yeah, God forbid a, a practice owner is, is, is going to be busy. They, um, they might be able to point you in the direction of, of someone who will be able to mentor you. Like one of our physios that works here, he actually has his mentoring with a, a physio in New South Wales. So in another, in another state, he yeah, catches up with him via Zoom once a fortnight, something like that, um, rather than having any in-house mentoring. And he, he, he's learning and growing. And I've seen the, the improvement in him as well um, from that. So your mentor doesn't have to be the business owner or someone actually there with you um, as much as that's probably more ideal. Um, yeah, there's tons of ways around it and to get mentorship. You just might have to get creative and, and make it happen. Yep, very good point. So I'll just wrap up the end. So that basically tackles the entire structure. We've only gone 13 minutes over time, which is fantastic for us because we're usually quite verbose. Um, so like I've said, everyone will get a follow-up email. The recording of this will be available via the um, P3 for free subscription, which essentially what that is, is you subscribe to it, you get a login to the P3 site and all the learning resources, these um, webinars and future webinars will go into that. So you can download the Kajabi app on your phone and it will just get delivered straight there. Um, so wrapping that up, thank you everyone for participating. And because we've still got about four minutes before we get kicked off Zoom, um, in the chat box, if anyone has any last minute questions that they want to shoot through, um, you can do that now. If not, you can email us at p3podiatry at gmail.com after the event, and then we will answer those questions in the follow-up email. So I'll give everyone a couple of seconds now. If there's a few questions, shoot them in and yeah, we'll go from there. Good stuff. How was your beer? Yeah, it was actually really good. It's the one that I'm addicted to, the Splice of Heaven. Oh, you're welcome, Anthony Beshra and yep. Uh, that's the Moon Dog one. I'm addicted to that. Nice. We'll have to go. Maybe we can go to Moon Dog uh, uh, World, Moon Dog World next weekend. Oh, thanks, Haley and Zach. Uh, hey, and hang on, there was someone else. Sorry, it's scrolling too quick. <laughs> um, Veronica, Caitlin. Um, yes, everyone, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, I'm flying to Melbourne, hopefully this weekend <laughs> to have a beer with Jackson. Moondog's right. in Melbourne, yeah? Yeah, that's it. Ooh, game on. <laughs> Good. 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll jump off now. And yeah, like I said, you'll get some follow-up emails and the recording will be available after. Thanks. Bye.